welcome to the latest in our webinar series, Advanced Analyses for Breeding. Um, today we are, well, Salvador is going to be guiding us from the more traditional GBLUP through to uh, more advanced XGBLUP, more complex and demanding models. As always, whilst we wait for people to join, do feel free to say hello in the chat. Let us know where you're from. Um, you know, if you've got any suggestions for future webinars, please feel free to post those in the chat. Uh, any data challenges that you're experiencing, we're always interested to know. Should you have any specific questions related to the webinar, if you could please post that in, those in the question and answer section, um, we will attempt to get to those today. Any problems or if there's anything that we can't attend to, details will be sent follow up uh, by follow up in the email where we'll also send a recording of the webinar for you to share. Um, I think that's all from me. Before I pass you on to Salvador, just to say, if you could do connect with us on LinkedIn, do sign up to our newsletter. That'll keep you informed about any future webinars, any future workshops um, and events that, that, that we're holding. And for now, I will pass you over to Salvador. Thanks, Salvador. Um, hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good night, uh, depending on where you are. It's nice to have uh, lots of people coming from different places and joining us. So I'm going to um, share my screen and start my uh, my slides. Um, so before I have talked about um, uh, genomic selection and I have talked about particularly about GBLAP, um, there was a seminar probably a year ago on which I presented the calculation of the genomic matrices and also um, the calculation of the, the analysis with GBLAB, particularly with uh, ASRMLR. Um, in this uh, webinar, I'm going to expand those. Um, I'm going to have several examples, some of them with animal, uh, particularly for aquaculture, and some of them with plants. And uh, I want to extend that to um, sort of more realistic examples. Um, that's what I'm using the word XGBLAP to denote complex GBLAP. Um, what I also consider to be the more realistic uh, GBLAPs uh, that we should be considering when we have repeated measures, spatial correlations, uh, messy data, several fixed or random effects, etc. So we should we should be moving from 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 uh, the, our initial models on GBLAP and, and also base B and base A uh, into something more realistic for our uh, programs. So first I'm going to mention that obviously we have used, we have several genomic selection packages and libraries, particularly in R and some other software that it uses, um, that, that obviously that performs the genomic selection for us and not only GBLAP, but some of the Bayesian um, approaches to. And often what we see is that we have some limitations. So we have a single record for an individual and that record usually is adjusted. Uh, it's already pro processed in a way that we have it summarized. And we have one single group of um, genetic information for that individual. So it's a one-to-one. -one. This obviously is no replicated data. We have to summarize the data into an adjusted value. Sometimes we use a spatial analysis. Sometimes we use other types of corrections. And that will be a two-step process. Again, that denotes that there is some loss of information. Um, so it, ideally, we don't want to use all the time a two-step process, but the software pro, uh, generates a limitations. Also, we have other things such as um, uh, the software we use or the packages we use sometimes don't allow for many fixed or random effects. Sometimes they allow for one or for the other or for none. Um, they are analyzed in a single response, so we have to move away from multi-trait analysis, even that there are some packages that do multi-trait but it's harder to model that uh, correlation structure. And in general, many of these packages don't allow us to, to have complex correlator errors, spatial components, and, and messiness in general, which is what we use when we have multi-environment, repeated measures, or multi-trait analysis. And some of the ways that we have come along, and you see it in some of the publication, is just to simplify the problem, for example, ignore the repeated measures or some, some crude uh, average to use as a response variable um, that are not statistically very purist, and they're not statistically totally correct. And mainly what they do is they affect our inferences later on. 
So this is where uh, I think we should be using, and, and many of the movement is to use the GBLAP in the context of the linear model. But in reality, what we're doing is we're just going back to what we did with the, with the linear mixed models on the pedigree-based analysis where we use the PBLAPs, so where we have complicated models with heterogeneous errors with repeated measures and everything. But what we're doing now is replacing the matrix. So this is where we have our uh, traditional um, animal model that we use in GBLAP. And um, it's you can consider several fixed effects. You can consider several random effects associated with the sign or with some other feature. And then you have your additive effect, uh, which in this case, we are going to model through a relationship matrix calculated by molecular data. Now we have lots of models from particularly the animal breeding literature with maternal effects, with correlated effects, permanent effects, and then also all the literature that deals with random random regression and so on. So they all use pedigree and they all use the A matrix. And now we're just in a position where we should use the same models, but just replace that A matrix by a GA matrix. That obviously produces some challenges. The first challenge is that we need to calculate this genomic matrix and, and there's many packages for that. And we need to check that it's invertible and so on. And the second challenge is going to be that once we have this matrix, obviously the model is more dense and it's more difficult to fit this. So there is many different libraries to, to obtain your genomic matrix. Uh, we produce the ASR genomics to get it, to check it, to tune it up, and then finally to get a relationship matrix inverse that you can use directly into ASRML R. So, but you can use many other things and you can generate your own, your own code for it. So once we have that matrix, and in my uh, webinar, I'm going to present, uh, but I'm going to assume we already have an, a stable and invertible um, genomic matrix. So we're going to use ASREML. Uh, the version is 4.2. So we have updated the version ASREML from 4.1 to 4.2. This is much faster. It makes better use of the memory. It has some parallelization routines. But in general, what it does really, it allows me to uh, deal with more dense matrices, more dense system of equations, and still use all the power of ASREML. Keep in mind that some of the analysis are too big, you will need a lot of more memory and you still will have to be patient. And it'll be slower than when you use pedigree, but in general, there shouldn't be much of a difficulty to move directly into this more realistic and complex analysis. Now, ASREML will use a function which is BM and you can check some of the other Webinars where we use the BM, this is going to specify which one is the generalized, the gen general genomic inverse. Um, and then we just implement that directly. And I'll show you a little bit on the code. Now we're going to be using complex models. And for the same reason, I'm going to be um, uh, specifying some complex variance structures. There's no time to present you all the details, but just keep in mind that in some cases we're going to model, for example, four traits and I'm going to use an instructor such as core GH, which allows me for each um, breeding value, define a genetic variance for trait one, trait two, trait three, or trait four, and a specific uh, correlations between trait one and trait two, one and three, and so on. So we can estimate all the elements that we need from a multi-trait analysis. If you replace this from multi-trace to multi-environments, then we have a correlation between environments. Again, this is a correlation structure that is very similar to the US. If you're familiar with SAS, it's also called UN, the N structure, uh, structure that we use to estimate variances and all the potential covariances between the levels. So that's what I'm going to be using. And I'm going to start with a multi trade analysis with Sunfish data. Now, multi trade analysis is very efficient and it's quite in, in, in uh, very widely popular these days. Uh, it allows me to combine information from several response variables. And then that in terms, if there's correlation between the response variable, it will improve the precision or the standard error or the breeding values. Um, the models are more complicated because you have to define the characteristic of each trait and then combine it into a single linear model. But you get estimation of those correlations that are used for selection index, or they are used in a, sometimes to estimate breeding values on individuals that were only measured for one trait and not the other trait. Uh, ASREML and all the routines that use mixed models, what they do is they stack the variable one or trait one against the trait two. 
And once they are stacked on the Ys, you have the effects also a stack that needs to be estimated for fixed effect, for the genetic effects, and then for the errors. And the key here is that we assume that the genetic effects, for example, the breeding value of individual one in trait one is correlated with the breeding value of the individual one in trait two because that correlation is non-zero or that covariance is non-zero. And that's what we need to estimate. So I'm going to go straight to my R and I have several examples. Uh, so I'll go here to the files. Um, so I'm going to directly use um, a, a salmon data set. Again, all of these will be available and some of this data is directly in our, our libraries. So this is the data set from uh, the salmon data set, which corresponds to 1500 individuals. Um, they are genotyped for around 7,000 markers. And then let me just show you a little bit of, um, so I have to load the library, ASR Genomics. Okay. So I look at the data, I'm assigning it to something called date tag. And what you see is this is a very simple um, data set where we have only two response variables. These are for a disease. One of them is called mean guild score, measure on individuals aware of serf twice. And then we have a mammalic log. More details are in the help and you can look more into the specific uh, library. But this, there is no other fixed effect. All the individuals were treated in the same tank. So the there's a common environment, there's no blocking, there's nothing else, it's just that. Um, so I'm going to load the genomics data that we already have. So I have two matrices here. I have a G blend, which is a genomic blend, and I have a genome inverse blend. So the genomic uh, blend, um, let me just tell you the dimension of that. So you have an idea. This is a matrix of 1,481 individuals, 1,481. We already obtained the inverse, so please check our other webinars for that. And I can check the attributes of that. And I know it's, in, it's invertible and it's ready to be used with ASREML. One of the things I need to do always is, is to check that you have all your individuals uh, in the genotypic data, in your phenotypic data. Um, so this is just one simple experiment. Um, I can do some checking of exploratory data analysis to check something about the distribution. Because I'm going to do a bivariate analysis, I'm just checking the potential correlation, phenotypic correlation between the two traits, which happens to be negative, minus 0.81. Again, something to help me to identify potential outliers and things like that. So because the data only has no other fixed or random effects, except the scores that they were measured, the traits, my model is very simple. We'll have only the ID of the individual. And I'm just going to make it as a factor. And I'm just ordering by ID my data. And there's nothing else into the my model. So ASREML is going to fit this very simple. I have my response variable, mean guild score, and overall mean. VM used to identify that this is a random effect of the individuals associated with a G inverse that we already prepared and I already show you. Some residual terms, use of access to extra memory, and then also something to avoid the elimination of the missing values on the Y if you have some missing values on the Y. As I mentioned, this is using 4.2. You can see it's not as quick as you will have it with a pedigree with 1500 individuals, um, but it still runs uh, relatively fast. Um, we can assess the plots and I have the variance components and you can um, use those variance components to calculate, for example, heritability. Again, we when we do a bivariate analysis, we analyze every single trait individually, which is what I'm doing here. And they give me starting values. So let me just jump into the bivariate analysis. The bivariate analysis requires, I'm just going to let it run, uh, requires the definition of the two traits. And there is an internal variable called trait that defines the level of each of the traits. So we'll use the C bind to define the two traits. And notice here that I'm using the same term as before to denote the individual effects, but these individual breeding values or genomic breeding values are correlated. And for that, I specify a core GH, which is going to be defined by the factor trait, which has two levels, the two traits. So this is a two by two matrix Kronecker product 
by a genomic matrix. So, and that's going to correlate all the individuals as they are correlated under genetics, and also the individuals as they are correlated with respect to their traits. You need to define also that the residual terms are correlated. So this is obviously a more complicated model because we have the same individual measure for the two traits and therefore the residual terms are also correlated. This ID individuals denotes individuals one through N, or one through 1481 and core GH uh, denotes the correlation structure, which is the same as before, but now this is going to be correlations in terms of residuals. So the model has converged. You can always look at your residual plots again. It's, if you did the first analysis, you won't have too many difficulties. Uh, you can see here for the different traits, again, detect new outliers. But obviously the most important thing that we need, it's the interpretation of the um, <clears throat> the interpretation of the variance components. Um, so let me just pull them again with a little bit more space. Um, so this minus nine nine represents the additive genetic correlation between the two traits, which is relatively high with a very small standard error. And this is a good sign. We know those two measurements relate to the level of gill disease on the fish. So that means genetically the rankings of the breeding values are going to be equivalent. I have elements associated with the additive variances for one trait, the mean gill score and the amoebic load. Ideally, they shouldn't be too different. So sometimes rescaling one variable or the other variable helps for the stability of the model. And this minus 0.76, which is another correlation, represents the correlation in terms of the residual effect between the two traits. So now I have everything I need. I can calculate again, uh, heritabilities. But the main thing here is what we want to see is that we have breeding values. So the blaps here with this command will meet me the breeding values from this analysis. I can extract the breeding values for gill score, for amoebic load, and I can just show you the solution for one and the solution for the other. We know they're negatively correlated. And then you can look at the rankings and then again use whichever is easier for you. In this case, the score will be much easier to measure um, because it's more visual than rather than running a, running a sample in the lab. So this is again, one case where we can use a bivariate. This can be extended for three, four or five traits. Um, so again, check our other webinars for that. The other extension I'm going to do is using in this particular case, uh, additive plus dominance. And this is more relevant in some of the plant uh, breeding, but the, the extension is very simple. Uh, we model only the additive effects. Now I'm going to add some non-additive effects. There is a theory associated that you can add um, define genomic matrices uh, for dominance effect, and then you can use the Hadamard product to define epistatic effects. I will just use additive and dominance effects. Uh, again, this is also quite, quite widely used these days in the animal literature. And what we need to do is we need to compute our A matrix, uh, in this case, genomic A matrix, which is based in this particular case in a calculation from Yang, but you can use Van Raden. And then we have different def definitions, one by Vite Sika, another by Su, to calculate our relationship matrix on dominance effects. So this is the notes, uh, the relationship between two individuals in terms of a specific combination of the parents. So for example, siblings, full sieves will share some portion of exactly the same combination from the mom and from the dad. That means they're going to have a similar response on that. Um, so this could be extended. So I'm just going to show you one example. Now the model is the same as the animal model where we associate A with a GA, but now we add a new factor that also is an ID that is associated with this GED matrix. And that's the example I want to show you here. <clears throat> so I'm going back to my R and I have a GBLAP AD. Um, I'm not showing you how this was done before the calculation of the genomic matrices. I'm just going to load them here. And let me show you a little bit what we have actually. So I have once more a G blend, which is the additive blend. I have a GD, which is the dominant matrix. And then we have the respective versions uh, of their inverses that are the ones we're going to use with AS Remo. The data set is the same, so I'm just going to focus on one of the traits. 
One thing is to check that, for example, the G inverse for additive effect is actually valid for AS Remol, and the dominance matrix is actually valid for AS Remol too. Again, you can use different libraries. We I use ASR genomics to generate these matrices and to check that they're invertible, etc. So one of the key things again is once more, our data is so simple. We have the ID, but I'm going to create IDDA and IDDD. So I need to copy the same factor ID. One of them is going to be associated with additive effects. The other one is going to be associated with dominance effects. And um, in that case, I'm going to have different effects that I need to separate and identify uniquely, okay? I can run just the additive part, which I'm going to do here, which is pretty much the same thing we just did before. Um, I'm just using the IDA part in my model. Now, once I extend this, um, you can we can calculate the heritability and we can calculate black values. And I just wanna show you again, uh, the heritability for this trait is 0 0.25. I can get the black values, which I'm going to call A effects just for now. And these are the a model that has only A effects and I can correlate my response variable with the estimated additive effects and that's 0 0.665. So it's as a measure of predictability, but it's, it's just very simple case. Now I can run my AD model. The AD model, notice that the only difference is that I have added this, uh, have it added the ADD. Now this is IDD associated with a GD inverse, the IDA is associated with the JA inverse. So you can you can imagine that it's it, it is taking a little bit longer because um, I have quite a bit of um, two dense matrices. The system of equations are going to become more complicated and this tends to take a few seconds. Um, <clears throat> so we'll we'll wait a little bit as, as it comes. Um, and one of the things is uh, you can have, you might need some more memory in this particular case, and you might have to add uh, additional workspace if you have a, a computer with, with more things. I, I can answer one or two questions uh, in between. Um, so uh, while, while we wait for this to run. So does the VM function need inverse of kinship matrix or in my world with kinship matrix and ASRML can do the inverse internally? Yes, um, you use the function VM, you can provide your own matrix. Um, you can provide uh, a matrix that is not invert and ASRML can, uh, we will invert it internally. So we'll use the solve function from R. Now that's often not the most uh, efficient way because if the matrix is unstable, it might be that the inverse is not well conditioned and that creates issues and ASRM will still go through it or it might kick you out. So it's not necessarily the best strategy. Okay, so so I recommend you use um, ASR genomics so you provide the right attributes and check your matrix inverse, it's in good form. Um, so we have probably a couple more iterations. Um, <clears throat> There's another, uh, there was another question in the chat actually, Salvador, I'm not sure if it's been resolved. Somebody was asking how the starting values were obtained. Um, I understand it was by running univariate uh, prior to the bivariate analysis. Um, and yes. then there was a further question uh, just confirming, is, is this an example of running univariate first for Gill scoring? Yes, so we run univariate for each trade individually and you check for outliers, for inconsistencies. You check if the heritability is big enough because if it's zero, that means some of the variance components are zero. And you do that by each of individual trade. And then once you finish with your analysis for each individual trade, uh, you use some of those variance components as a starting values. So this is what I did before. This is the correlation, the genetic, my guess of the genetic correlation between the two traits, which I did it using the phenotypic correlation. This is the variance uh, of the genetic variance associated with the first trait, which in this case is mean gill score. And this is the, the, uh, the generic variance associated with the second trait, which is the amniotic load. And that's what I use in this specific part. So it's very good to provide some starting values. ASRM will guess, but it's more likely to get lost into that, okay? 
So let me go back to the model that converts. It took a little bit of a little less than a minute. Uh, and again, this is 1500 individuals on, on two very dense matrices. Um, you can plot again and check things and your variance components are really what I want to see. This is the additive variance and this is the dominance variance. Now the dominance variance is very small, probably not significant. I, I can use a likelihood ratio test, which is actually what I'm doing in here. And it tells me that there is no significant um, difference between the model with and without the dominance effect. And again, this is an example that shows you that it can be done. I can calculate a heritability associated with the additive effects and a dominance ratio, which again, once more tells me there's not really that much on the dominance part for this particular trait. And the other thing I can do is I can extract my additive effects and I can extract my dominance effects. And if I sum my additive plus my dominance, I take an approximated value for the total genetic value. Again, this is, tends to be more relevant for plant breeders where you want to try to estimate the total clonal value, and then you have the additive plus the dominant plus potentially some higher order interactions. Um, it's not very easy, it has improved to be very easy. Again, exploring the dominance effect could be quite relevant to identify individuals that from the population that you are analyzing tend to have good specific combining ability. That's what the dominance effect are. So it's an estimation of the specific combining ability of that individual in itself when it mates with the rest. It's not the specific combining ability that we have when we cross A against B. Um, so, and the, the values are here and some of them are really small for the added, for the dominance effect, of course, because the variance is too small and the genetic effects will be the sum of those two. And this is the correlation from just fitting one term. And this is the correlation from fitting the two terms. There is an improvement, potentially there is an overparameterization. So we have to be a bit careful. Again, I'm just illustrating that you can extend the model. So this is what I call the X GBLAP, where we have more complex models that might give us, help us to access and do some slightly different things. Okay, let me move to another example. I'm going to move away from from animal breeding, uh, and I'm going to do some plant uh, breeding analysis. The first case where we want to do something in most of our experiments, we have individuals that are genotype, and we want to do, obviously, calculate breeding values for those individuals into a single site, and we do some form of a spatial analysis. And the typical spatial analysis uses linear trends, polynomials, row column effects, um, the as fixed, some of them as fixed effects, some of them as random effect. Again, there's a whole uh, topic uh, behind this. And then we model some form of patches, sometimes with incomplete blocks or with uh, random rows and random columns. And then we modeled um, the autoregressive structure, uh, often with, an, uh, with different structures. And this, the most typical one is the AR1. AR1 separable structure, which is kind of described here. Again, no, I'm, I'm not going too much into details, but it's important to know that this structure is defined without nugget and with nugget. And what it defines the, really is that there is an error associated with the spatial component, and there's an error associated with a microsite or measurement error, which is often called nugget in the geostatistics literature. So my model for this simple spatial analysis will have a group of fixed effects. Again, we can have rep, we can have a covariable, we can have some design elements, uh, but also polynomials if we want a model trend. Then we have a beta, a B effect, which is some random effects, usually an incomplete block or some random rows, columns, et cetera, splines if you are modeling trends on a different way. And then you have um, your random effect, in this case, the genotype, which we can associate with an A matrix or we can associate with a GA matrix. So in this case, I just put an A, but it could be any relationship matrix. And we have our two types of error, the spatial error, which is autoregressive, autoregressive, and the nugget error, which is independent. And sometimes this is spatial component here is thrown into the residual part of the model because it corresponds to an error, but sometimes it's put into the random part of the model because we consider that as a random effect to be correct. Both options are, are equally good. Um, the second one is slightly 
easier to deal with because we can have missing values in our data set. And that's what I'm going to use here. Okay. So again, we can use anything we need from this spatial analysis. So let me just move to that. Um, and I'm going to use this barley data set. Let me clear everything from here. And let me clear everything from here. And I'm going to restart. I'm going to restart R and so on. Things get stuck into memory. So when you do a lot of uh, genomic selection analysis, you want to have a clean, a clean background. So that's what I'm going to do. Just calling again ASREML. I'm going to read this Barley data set. Um, I have I have this one corresponds to two sites. Um, there is a publication associated with it. I have more details. Um, in some in another document that I will attach, but this corresponds to several uh, genotypes. Let me just look at the structure. We have lines. This is recombinant bred lines. Um, I can't remember the number. We need to define this as a factor. So let me just do that. The tag lines. Let's just see length of unique. And then we know how many lines we have. 478 lines. Um, this is two sites, one called 10 and the other one called 11. So I'm going to proceed to do um, MET analysis with this data. Um, we have different design elements, rep, column, rows. So that means I have the, the components, the spatial components, and the response variable is the height of the plants. So once more, I have my GA matrix. Um, this is what you see here. From, from this data, we have uh, obviously the GA matrix is going to be a 478 individuals. Now I'm going to check that inverse. It is true inverse. It has several levels and so on. And the main thing is that I need to check if everything that is on the phenotypic data, it's defined on that genomic data. And it's not. There is one individual that is not. Um, uh, there is actually several records. Uh, a group of, I can't remember the number, but there's a group of individuals that, that are not in the phenotypic data, which is okay, but there is a group of individuals who are in the phenotypic data that are not in the kinship matrix, these 85 records. So it's, individuals are replicated um, two times here. So that means it's half of that. Um, and that is a bit of a problem because obviously if they're not defined in the genomic matrix, uh, that means there, something happened with the genotypic data, they're fail or they were dropped when we did the filtering to calculate the genomic matrix because of they have too many missing values or, or so. So that means we need to make sure the phenotypic data doesn't have those individuals. And these are the mismatches. So this is the list, but this is the, the genotypes that are actually absent in the genomic matrix. So I'm just going to filter the phenotypic data. And instead of 4,695, 4, I have 4,610 individuals. So those 85 records were eliminated. I'm going to um, define everything as a factor that I need to fit my spatial analysis. The data, it's a new data. Uh, and then you can see here that each genotype that it's defined in the genomic matrix has two records and some individuals are only replicated once. But um, this one is actually the number of records they have per rep. Okay, so we have it replicated by rep. So it's, it's not a bad level of replication. This is what I was mentioning before that we have um, realistic data. I could take the average across the five reps for each of those individuals. And in some of the cases, individuals will have 10 observations. In some of the cases, they'll have five, assuming there is no missing values, because if there's missing values, it's going to be a problem. But I don't really need to do that. I can use the actual raw data and allow the number of copies to vary and have a slightly different weights internally when I do my genomic selection analysis for this data. And that's what I'm going to do. So I have a few more checks, a histogram, and then another check to give me the means of the different sites and then the variances of the different sites, which differ a little bit, but not so much. Now, when I did this analysis before, I found several outliers. So I'm just going to eliminate the outliers. It's going to create NAs on my data set. Just trust me on that. So you, they were very clear outliers, so they have to be eliminated. 
And then now I'm going to focus my special analysis only on site 10. So that's where I create this data S that has site 10. There is many ways to do my model. I'm going to analyze the response variable height, my design effect that is rep. And then this is my genomic matrix inverse associated with the factor lines, which is already filtered. And I'm defining this term, which is the non-additive effect. So this is a model that has non-additive effects all collapse into one term, which is this IDV lines, okay? That is going to absorb all the other genetic components because these individuals are replicates, identical replicates all throughout. They are recombinant in bread line, so there's not a problem. And the residual term, I'm not block, I'm blocking this out because I'm not fitting the residual term. And this one obviously it, it doesn't really take that much. It's not a very big data set with around 500 individuals. Now, um, I could model my special component directly by specifying an autoregressive rows and columns, but because I eliminated data, I don't have all the combination of all the rows and all the columns on my data S originally. So what I'm going to do is instead of defining my special component on the, on the R part or the residual part, I'm going to define it into the random part, okay? So I'm just going to... So this is what we have here. I move that to the random part, and then I have my residuals defined just by as normal, by just some units. So this residual is going to be the nugget, and this is going to be my special components into the G part or the random part. Notice that I also commented out this. I could add polynomials of orthogonal polynomials of order two here and there to fit the different models but I'm not going to, to do it. I'm just going to fit a simple, uh, well, relatively simple spatial analysis where my only main elements are the correlations in terms of patches between columns and between rows. Um, this, the previous model had a log likelihood of 5579, and this new model, it has a likelihood of 5367. So clearly it's a big improvement on the model. And when we look at the variance components, you can see here, this is the genetic variance of the non-additive part, because it's the IDB lines. This is the additive part associated with the genomic relationship matrix we define. This is the correlation between uh, rows. Um, this is the correlation between rows. Yes, <clears throat> sorry, it's the correlation between columns. And it's very small. This is the, the variance associated with the spatial component, which is the variance in this variance that I defined there. And then that's the spatial error variance. And then I have a correlation between rows, uh, which is the one defined here, which is quite high. So there is a strong correlation across rows that has to do with the way the experiment was set up and my nugget or my new error variance and so on. So this model fits relatively well. We can look at residual plots. We Sadly, we can see the variogram, but we can look at the residual plots. And then again, this is just showing the nugget error, okay? And we have the variance components and so on. And actually this is a likelihood ratio test to compare the two models, which tells me the spatial analysis is much, uh, much better statistically. So as you can see, I use the raw data, 10 copies in some cases, five copies, eliminating some individuals if I can add different random effects, fixed effects to model my spatial structure, whichever way I want it, I'm going to get it because there is no limitation on the definition of the animal model that we have. In this case, animal uh, breeding value or a genetic additive effect plus non-additive effects. So this is just to show you the blobs. So I have the blobs to make my selections, rank my potential parents. You have the additive effects first, and then you have the non-additive effects on the bottom. And actually these are the residual parts. So just I'm just going to extract the additive effects and then you can see, and then eventually rank your individuals by additive effects. <clears throat> so again, as I was just mentioning, you can do um, any any sort of a special analysis you might want. I know so this is a bit quick, yeah. Could you just quickly touch on, um, can we include both genotyped and non-genotyped individuals in the random part of the model? Yes, we can. 
Um, but in that case, you're talking about single step GBLAP. So for that, we need to have the pedigree of the individuals which are not being genotyped, which I don't have in this particular data set. And then we need to calculate the, the H matrix. And the H matrix will be this hybrid matrix that combines pedigree and genomics data for the single step GBLAP or sometimes called H GBLAP or H -blap. Um, You have to prepare everything. And then you. the only difference is that you provide a different, you provide an H inverse blend or no blend if you need to, to tweak it up a little bit to make it invertible. So it's not a problem. It's just a bit more work. Okay. I hope that helps, Kevin. Thanks, Salvador. Good. Um, so let me move into the last example. I know I've been running a bit, but um, into the last example, um, which is again expanding or these complex G black models to more realistic situations where we have a multi environment. Now you can do an MIT, MET in two steps, which is very typical when you have very large experiments where you analyze first each individual trial. And in that case, you will analyze them uh, without any genomic matrix because you're obtaining an adjusted value. And then you use those adjusted values together with weight into a second step analysis with a genomic matrix. You can also venture and do that in one big analysis, in one go or single step. Uh, in, and this is what I'm going to show you here for a reduced example, which is this barley data set that has only two sites. Okay. So there's many benefits of MET analysis. Um, obviously, we want to combine the data from different experiments. We want to estimate a breeding value or a genomic breeding value of an individual ac across all the trial trials or predict individuals who were not present in one trial to another trial. So we need to estimate those genetic correlations between environments. Um, so that it has lots of other benefits. So we estimate hair abilities across all the trials. We estimate breeding values, correlations between trial to trial to help me assess um, everything um, about my breeding program or the structure of my um, <clears throat> of my sites where I'm testing my genotypes. So this is quite well established. Um, again, what we are doing different here is that we are using a genomic matrix. So I'm going to use a nested model where I'm going to have yield, which is my response variable, for example, whatever it is, uh, a fixed effect of environment or site in this particular case, a core GH for the sites, uh, which in this case, I'm going to have two, and then the genotype. In this case, the genotype is assumed to be independent, but I'm going to extend that model. This means genotype nested within site, which is going to give me a breeding value of that genotype or a genetic effect of that genotype within each of the sites. So I'm going to extend that to use a genomic matrix on this. So I'm going to use BM genotype. And so on. I can add other effects if I have the sign effects, uh, reps, and so on, which I'm going to have. And then the residual part is just to denote that I have different error variances per site. So I'm using the raw data. I'm not using weights directly plugging in there with my genomic matrix to give me all the pieces of information that I want. So let me show you that example. Um, this is where it comes here. I only have two sites. Again, the more sites you have, the more demanding the linear model will be because you want to estimate correlation between every pair of sites and also your dense matrix that you have, which is your genomic matrix. With two sites, I have it copied twice on my mixed model system of equations. If I have 10 sites, I'll have it copied 10 times. It is quite dense and that's going to obviously create um, need in more resources and create a slow iterations and so on. But uh, again, if that's what you need, that's that's fine. And then that's 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 the analysis will just wait. So I'm just having again my data. I'm not going to eliminate too many things before. I have my starting values. Now these are the starting values based on single site analysis. So it's a little bit of a similarity with the multi-trait. Um, let me just go by the terms first. So this is my response variable height. I have site, which is a fixed effect. And remember, I had a design factor of rep nested within site. Again, I could have other elements. 
Now I'm going to say these are my lines associated with that genomic matrix. It doesn't matter the order you put them. And now I'm going to say my factor side, which has two levels, is going to be a two by two matrix with a variance for the first environment, a variance for the second environment, and a covariance, in this case, is going to be a correlation between the two environments. So I'm starting providing a starting value. 0 0.5 is what I guess the correlation will be, and the variances for first site and then for the second site. And I provide this in the init. On top of that, I'm going to also estimate uh, additive effects. Additive effects are not associated with a genomic matrix. So I'm just going to say ID lines. So they are individual effects. Notice that I'm not putting the IDV because that clashes with the next term, which is the core GH. So this is just an identity matrix. And the core GH, again, is a two by two, will have the correlation between the non-additive effects on individuals across the two sites, because the same individuals replicated in the two sites. Then I have spatial components. And notice that I have one spatial component by site. I'm using the at site statement. And actually, I should probably let this run while we while describe. And you can see I have at site comma one, which denotes the first level of the first site, which is 10, and the second level of the second site, which is two. And these are the autoregressive. You can add order effects. You can add polynomial effects if some of the sites require them. All that comes when you analyze individually each of the trials. Again, sufficient memory. And finally, I ask for heterogeneous errors by site. So I want a different error variance by site. Remember, I'm using the raw data, so I can directly plug it in there and see what happens. Okay. So we have a few iterations. They shouldn't really take too much. Uh, again, if you're using um, several trials, you will have some issues. If also you will have issues if you're using core GH with several trials, so I recommend you use the factor analytic, which also uses a little bit less memory, but again, it, it requires some resources. Okay, so it has converged, no screaming of any sort. I can do my plots and you will see different plots by site. And again, help you to detect outliers by site eliminate things because I already cleaned the data and so on. I don't have them anymore. Uh, let me just close a few things. And then my variance components. Uh, notice that the big difference between this analysis and the multi-trade analysis is that the residual terms are uncorrelated between individuals on one side and individuals on the other side. So what I have here is this is the additive correlation of, sorry, sorry this is the non-additive effects. The line on itself is just the non-additive effects. This is the correlation of the all non-additive effects, dominance and epistasis. Again, this is a good way to summarize those effects, push them away from, from your analysis, and still have them even if you don't necessarily need or want to use them. And you have the variances associated with the first site, site 10 and site 11. These are the most important ones. These are the additive genetic correlations between the sites, in this case, based on GBVs, almost 0.94. That means there's a, a lot of consistency on the ranking between one environment and the other environment. We have also the variances that I can use later to calculate heritabilities. And then I have my spatial components for the site 10, which remember we have 0.1 and 0.9. And for the other site seems to be the other way around or not so much. It seems to be also very high for the rows and very high for the columns simultaneously. Again, it's the nature of the site. Finally, I have the residual variances or the nugget variances that I can again use to calculate a heritability, which I haven't done here, but it's there. And I'm ready to do different things. So depends what, what you want to do with this data. I'm extracting my GEBBs. Again, I have GEBBs for one site and the other side for the same individual. If I average these two, I'm going to have the overall performance of that genotype across, again, these two sites. Uh, these are going to be the BEVs, but also you can do something similar with the non-additive effects, which are these two. And you can see here, they change a little bit more. The correlation is not as tight as with the other one. And, and then you can, again, also uh, construct potential genetic values. So 
again, with that, um, I'm pretty much cover a, a good variety of different models. I, I know there's a lot more details on the specific models, but I just wanted to show you that you can fit more complex genomic models. Don't have to really frame yourself on what some of the software provides you that says I only have one response, everything, no copies, I need to summarize the data. I think it's time for us to move away from that and use all the machinery of the animal model uh, in the different software. Again, it's going to cost us a little bit of resources. ASREML R4.2 is much faster than 4.1. Uh, R is getting better to manage memory. And again, we'll have faster computers and access to more RAM memory. So that's some of the things that are using servers and so on. Before I go to questions, um, a couple of things. Uh, there is three other webinars that kind of link to this. So here they are. If you want to know a bit more about GBLABS and how I constructed those genomic matrices, I'll also be providing all the files and so on that you can download. There is another webinar on multi-trade that explains more about the models and the correlation structure and chronicle products and so on. And then also another one about multi-environment where I'll use a one-step and a two-step uh, approach. So you can also have an idea of those. And finally, um, I've, been I've been putting together a genomic selection e-learning course. Uh, so uh, this one will be host host into this uh, web page. Now we have also on that web page uh, another set of online courses that you can do at any time. Some of them are introductory and some of them are a little bit more advanced, but they give you an idea and facilitate um, your the use of ASREML for you. Okay, so I'm open for questions. Um, Carrie, I don't know if you want to lead. Oh, sure, thanks for that, Salvador. I just want to say also thank you for posting those webinar resources. They'll also be sent in the follow-up email. Um, there has been some interest from the audience in looking at the entire pipeline, um, and I think those webinars will be will be helpful. Um, yeah, so as usual, we've got, we've got some questions around optimal optimal rather numbers. So Juan asks, in your experience, would a trivariate analysis for four sites and 3,000 individuals be feasible? And that would be to model the genetic covariances between the traits and the sites. So it says four sites and uh, so four sites and 3,000 yeah, individuals. Four sites, 3,000 yeah. individuals. Yes, it'll be feasible. Um, so you're talking about three times four. So I mean, you're talking about a 12 by 12 matrix. Um, it's going to, I've done it and it's possible. Um, you probably need a lot of preparation for checking each individual uh, site and each individual trait. And it's not very easy to model the correlation. So you have to use a few tricks. And actually that's a topic for another webinar. Um, now you will need a lot of RAM memory because that 3000 by 3000 matrix is going to have to be replicated 12 times. Um, so yes, it is possible, but you need the resources. Lovely, thank you. Um, okay, and another one here. <laughs> you, you might want to read it rather than me reading it out, Salvador. Um, so so from, from Hari, um, there's the, okay, um, that's, um, so he's asking about this component with the additive and the non-additive. Um, does they work when we want to have a compound symmetry? Um, yes, it's going to work if you want to use a compound symmetry. So, um, so you're defining a model that it's an interaction model against a model that is a nested model and those models are equivalent so your first model which is uh, bm and then bm site it, it's going to fit quicker and faster because it's less demanding on the algorithms that you need because the two elements are independent when you use the core b the elements are dependent and that creates a little bit more of uh, use of resources but the models are totally equivalent so um hope that helps all right and then we've just got one final question from kevin um you mentioned in the first met stages that the genomic relationship matrices are not included in those 
Is there a reason why not? And could they be included potentially? So, yes. Yeah, so there is different ways to do this. So if you're, well, this is the case of MET and where I'm thinking about normally I have, normally I have uh, clonally replicated data, like in the barley experiment. So uh, in that case, what I will do is I will use the genotype as a fixed effect and then get a prediction or a blue plus the mean with the standard error that I will use as a weight. Uh, and I use, in all those cases, I'm not using the genomic matrix. I might use the genomic matrix by side just to assess if there's a heritability, but not for processing that, um, that data. So once I get the predictions, um, I will use the predictions on the weights in a two-stage analysis with a genomic matrix. Now, can I... Um, if I use the genomic matrix on the first step, I'm actually fitting the model and, and doing the shrinkage once, uh, once. And then when I do the two step, I'm going to do the shrinkage a second time. So that's not recommended. Now, what happens in some cases with particularly animal breeding data is that sometimes you need a breeding value to fit the models. Um, so you have to use this deregress breeding value. So in that case, you use the genomic matrix on the first step to get breeding values that you have to unshrink or deregress. And those are your response variables to use on the second step that you're going to do with some genomic model. So, but it's a bit, it's not the case of MET. Okay. I see questions Great. coming in and out, but yeah. I think that's pretty much it. I think that covers uh, the questions, unusually. Okay. But if there, it's good. Um, if there is more questions, um, we can you can send them in, put them in later, or and, and I'm happy to answer them. Uh, I I know the topic went a little bit quick because I wanted to show you different models, but um, but it will it will it should work. Okay. Yeah. Also, just to respond to a few other questions, um, if you don't have if you currently don't have access to ASRML ASRML. Um, and would like to grab a trial, do contact us. We'd be happy to provide that so you can, you know, put into practice what you've seen today. I'm more than happy to offer a trial to yourself and your colleagues. We will be following up. We'll be sending the scripts and the resources um, and sharing a recording of this webinar. And again, feel free to share that with your colleagues. Um, We've got two Perfect. minutes. One more question just come in, Salvador. If you've uh, if you've got the voice left to answer it. Yeah. Um, How do you convert blab to the scale of response variable? Yes. Well, actually, blab is already on the scale of the response variable. Um, it is a deviation from the overall mean. So if you add the overall mean, then you will get the mu plus the blab, and that corresponds to the performance of the offspring of that individual when it's mated with another individual with equal breeding value. Okay, so that's the interpretation of uh, breeding value in general, but you're rescaling it to, to add a mean. Okay. Lovely. Well, thank you once again. Uh, very informative, Salvador. As I said before, do uh, connect on our LinkedIn, um, sign up for our newsletter, keep on top of all the other webinars and the things that, that are going on. Um, and thank you all once again for joining. And thank you everybody for joining too. See you next time. <laughs>